this is really what we're coming into with acceptance. When we're looking at digital tools, there's more and more and more. This is a superfluous amount of digital tools. And when, is, when can we say enough is enough? And when do we say this is helping us? And that's kind of what we're going to explore today. I'd like to introduce the final um, speakers of this track. We have David James, who's head of digital at the National Museum of Wales. Hi. And we also have Inna Gutz, who's creative leader at Jüdische Kulturtage Rhein-Ruhr. I think I actually pronounced those two almost right this time. That was quite good. But leading the track, this is where I'll mess it up, Juan. Juan Pradas from Etopia Center for Art and Technology. Would you like to kick off the discussion for us? Give Juan a big round of applause, everyone. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, namaste to everyone again. And uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you for being here, all of you, and especially I would like to congratulate our Dortmund U friends uh, for uh, organizing this conference. Uh, last year, we organized the previous one in Zaragoza, and our team and Isabel uh, Sebrian, who was also before, almost died, so we know how hard it is, and everything is running very smoothly. The contacts are great. Uh, and I want to thank uh, all of you, Abhai, Jenny, uh, and uh, all the team, of course, with Brita. Um, and basically, I will play somehow a devil advocate's role in this, in this panel, because uh, we, as Ethiopia Center for Art Technology, we're supposed to be a digital center, but one of the key findings that we have learned with smart places and also with uh, our existence, with our role. We're a new institution, we are six years old. Uh, we are run by the City Council of Zaragoza. And apparently we are a digital center, but we have learned that uh, you, have, you cannot neglect all the analogic side. Uh, all the, basically how to communicate with your audience, how to engage communities, how to reach new users. Digital is key, you cannot be out, of course, you, you have to do it, but you also have to use uh, all the classic analogic uh, tools. So taking back what was discussed with my colleagues and the panel some weeks ago, uh, I would say that digital is, uh, of course, is a tool, but it's not the vehicle. That's also something that we've learned in smart places. So first of all, introducing Ethiopia, um, we are in Zaragoza. Uh, which is um, somehow similar to Dortmund, 700,000 uh, people, industrial town, proud of it, football club, students, beer. So there are some similarities uh, with Dortmund, also with uh, other partner cities in small places like Bilbao. And, uh, but we were not a digital city um, 10 or 12 years ago when our project uh, started. We were not perceived at it, and maybe today we're still not perceived at it, but the city has uh, evolved, and, I think, and we think that Ethiopia has played somehow a role in it. We're a cultural institution, but we're not a museum. When we try to define what we are, we always say that we're not a museum, we're not a lab, we're not an incubator, but we are somehow, we try to create, we're a hybrid equipment, a hybrid uh, facility, and we try to create an ecosystem of innovation. So uh, this, which sounds very somehow glamorous, is really hard uh, to, to achieve. Uh, and we, have, we share many similarities with the U, with this house, and with all other centers in small places, such as, for example, Ascuna Central, because we are uh, run by the city council, but we have uh, other players in the house which are it's uh, very important. We have somehow a foundation, a stiftung, uh, which is Zaragoza City of Knowledge, which, in which uh, we have private uh, sponsors, such as spa case, universities, and they are a very important, crucial players in many of our uh, programs. So thanks to public-private partnership, I would say that it's, it's crucial. Even if it's the city who is, or the city council who is leading, uh, in our case, the role of other partners is uh, definitely key for, for that. So 
what we are. We are not a museum, but we have labs, for example, with the University of Zaragoza, 10 labs for fab labs, uh, digital fabrication, 3D printing, uh, biology, visualization, sound, video. We have two incubators in our uh, somehow uh, building, which is a big building, 16,000 uh, square meters. It's a new building. It's not so beautiful and glamorous as the U or uh, uh, Alondiga Ascuna uh, Bilbao, which are old uh, buildings refurbished. Ours is new, but we share many features together, like, for example, our media facade, which is not as beautiful as this one. It's all, also for... Uh, evening uh, use, but it's part of somehow our, our identity and many of our programs. Apart from that, uh, from the labs, the incubator, we have, of course, exhibition halls. We try to produce most of our exhibitions in-house with local artists and creators using all our digital facilities, so that's one of our main, it's an, in our, of our main features, it's really in our DNA, uh, put together analogic and digital, uh, so there is of course contemporary art, but there's new media. In, in almost all our, in most of our exhibitions, new media is an important part of it, and uh, we try to foster local creators. We have very few exhibitions which are on, on itinerants. So uh, apart from that, we have also um, many spaces for events, uh, similar also to this house and and the um, and the um, and Ascuna and other partners. We have many programs for kids, uh, similar to Tsui uh, here, Ethiopia Kids, which is a summer camp for 800 kids uh, devoted to technology. And uh, we have also experience that in that case, in, uh, when talking about kids, uh, technology and all the digital devices are uh, basically the core of, the, of many of our activities, but we have gone back somehow because since 2012, when we, when we started doing this, all these uh, kids' uh, activities, we have seen that uh, kids are more and more, I wouldn't say empowered because I'm, I don't like the word, but consumed by the devices and the screens. So we try to somehow put the technology, of course, but to put some also manual and analogic uh, activities, uh, going back to the, to the old past, as I say. Regarding our visitor numbers, they are not an obsession for us, of course, like any other cultural institution. Uh, but we, what we try to do is reaching a new audience, engaging new communities, and in this, I think uh, Smart Places has been really helpful uh, for, for that because uh, we are not part of the culture department of the city council, but we are run by the technology department. So basically our audience traditionally was techies, nerds, geeks, people who were really IT savvy. And uh, we are trying to approach uh, cultural users, people who are really interested in cultural contemporary cultural uh, events with uh, new cycles. Some of them are part of uh, Smart Places, Isabel related some of them, and also through activities which combine and blend together uh, technology with, uh, with culture. Uh, and uh, going to some, to some of the, also some of the things that have been said here today, physical, physical spaces matters as, uh, the speaker from uh, Stockholm Museum said, uh, for us, uh, we see that many of the things, even if there are many of the programs that have a digital platform, a digital side in it, it's always uh, crucial to have an on-site activity there with things when, where people can gather, where people can congregate, even many of the events or the conferences after uh, the event, there is a beer working because really what we have seen is that you have to animate uh, all your programs, but you have to also um, let people gather and congregate after uh, the event is, is on. And uh, regarding uh, basically the, what is the, the topic of this uh, session, uh, how digital uh, can you be? Uh, well, uh, as I said, uh, it's important not to neglect 
of the conventional sites, especially in commu when communicating and when engaging. One of, I think one of the things that we have learned with Smart Places is the crucial role of mediation. When we started the project, probably in the spotlight session we will talk more about this, but when we started the project uh, uh, six, seven years ago, uh, we had the idea that uh, with a joint uh, technological platform we would engage new audience, we will create somehow like a pan-European audience uh, in which would be very interesting, very interesting for to many of our activities and we now uh, what, with everything that we have learned we know that that's not the case uh, at all. We have uh, reached somehow I think a common ground of uh, how to communicate our activities. Uh, I think Smart Places has been very useful for, for that uh, digitally, uh, but we have also uh, basically learned that you have to use traditional tools. Uh, I mean, of course, you have to be in social networks. We are in all social networks. You have to animate that. Uh, in our case, most of our social networks being pretty autocritical are more Inf informative than uh, responsive. People, uh, users don't really react to many of uh, what we, the things that we post on on our social network. So there's much to do, uh, much to to do in our case for for that. But apart from that, you have to use conventional tools, mailings, uh, flyers, brochures, focus groups. Uh, conferences outside your center. So you have to, to really tackle your audience and tailor and customize uh, all the information for every user group. And one other thing that we have learned from these projects and from many of the activities is you have to blend and use a jargon which is uh, understandable, under, understandable for humans, for normal humans, because we are usually in our technological or entrepreneur or innovation or cultural uh, register, we think that's uh, usually transmittable to anyone, but uh, that's not the case. I mean, you have to really, when you are doing an activity which is uh, such as, for example, I think as, as UR Art, which was a joint activity of uh, small places last year, which was a great event in in the eight cities which were taking part, we had to adapt the information and the messages to what uh, to the users of every town. In our case, it was tailored for youngsters, uh, for teenagers, and you have to animate that with previous activities and also with a clear uh, register. So I won't go into longer talking about us. I just want to uh, present you our speakers. The next speaker is, uh, which are much more digital than me, probably. Uh, David James is uh, from the National Museum in Wales, and he has been specialized in digital uh, contents and digital product development for more than a decade. And uh, the, he has led some, not only some introducing uh, social media into big organization, but everything which is related to digital contents. So, David, if you want to come to the stage. So, excuse me, I'm working off my notes on the laptop and trying to get that to move as well, so, okay. Hi there, so yeah, as um, mentioned, my name's David, I'm the head of digital at National Museum of Wales, um, and I'm going to quickly present some of my experience of digital in a museum, as well as an overview of some research I've done about digital teams in the cultural sector, um, and maybe throw in some gifts as well. Okay, so initially I'll focus on just how digital can museums be, and firstly I'll provide bit of background into, into my organisation. So I'm Gerdor Cymru, it's a bilingual cultural organisation that welcomes uh, one, over 1 1.8 million visitors uh, a year to its seven museums. And it has a collection of around four and a half, five million objects. And the bulk of our funding comes from Welsh government. 
Our museums include National Museum Cardiff that houses art, natural science, uh, St Fagans National History Museum, uh, which is an open-air museum that, with around 40 dismantled and re-erected buildings on site. Uh, the National Roman Legion Museum, which is based in the uh, Roman fortress at Caleon. Uh, Big Pit, the National Coal Museum, which is a brilliant guided underground tour. A bit cliched, I admit. Um, National Wall Museum, so restored listed mill buildings and working historic machinery. National Waterfront Museum, which tells the story of industry in Wales over 300 years, and National Slate Museum. So as you can see, we've got a wealth of information to share in an array of different subjects. And central to the digital activity at the museums are the digital teams and how they work within museums. And I'm going to give you a short history of museums, because I was told I've got a little bit more time. Um, <laughs> So many of those skills came around organically. They originated in a variety of departments or were driven by projects. Some organizations developed strategies to bring together the disparate digital resources into one group. And then teams have continued to evolve in scope and size. So we don't really have the speed uh, or the agility of some more com commercial organizations. And why is this? Well, small revenue budgets. Um, we can't just... Um, grow a digital team quickly. We've got statutory obligations as well around things like our collections. We just can't cull a load of staff in one area to make up in more contemporary areas. And there's a very low staff turnover as, as well. And I'll mention some of these later on. And in terms of National Museum Wales, it's meant a lot of strat strategies, policies, but the real point um, of realisation came uh, around 2012, 2013, when it was understood that this was a change of culture that we had to do. We were moving from being a production bottleneck to enabling other parts of the organisation to work digitally. We weren't going to grow by massive numbers. And as Shana said, digital is a dimension of everything. So the sector was starting to realise that for change to happen, digitally, digital would need to be a bit more embedded in the other departments within those institutions. So what has this meant for the digital output of Amgeddfa Cymru National Museum Wales? Well, it's not about technology. We've tried numerous approaches for digital experiences, but soon realized that without that investment in design, storytelling, and content, things would potentially fail. But for some, an experience gave them a new perspective on an often visited museum. But we have big challenges in terms of onboarding. And according to research con uh, conducted by Frankly Green and Webb, the average app for a cultural institution is downloaded fewer than 1,000 downloads and opened less than once. Now, you think about this. You invest about £50,000 in an app. It's not cheap, is it? Even if it's about 25000 and you only have 1,000 downloads, that's a very expensive experience. So, at the, on the back of that, you know, successes are probably few and far between, which means we probably have to play a little with the delivery models that we have. Uh, also, we've got really interesting things to say and share that people are actually interested in. Um, also, they trust us, which is really important. So we now publish content in a more devolved structure in the organisation. Our staff can be responsive and engage with audiences directly. Um, we've got shared vision and accountability for our digital content, trying to assure, ensure consistency. It doesn't always happen that way. And we're, all in all, a more digitally literate organisation, though we've still got a very long way to go with this. And sometimes less is more. Um, for the development of the National Museum of History, we were driven by budgets, not necessarily human needs. And those cuts then in those budgets resulted in a 63% reduction in digital interactives and displays. But as a result of that, possibly a better user experience um, because the museum went on to win Art Fund's uh, UK Museum of the Year in 2019 as well. So I guess there's a question whoops, around... How digital do we want to be as visitors, customers, users, people? And as was mentioned before, the digital can be a fucking interruption. Um, 
But also, in, uh, apart from the people side of things, um, how are we investing in our cultural organizations to ensure that what we do digitally is relevant to our audiences and businesses? So, cue a whole load of research, and I teamed up with a fantastic Carty Price, who's head of digital at the VNA, and we did a big global analysis of how mu museums and other cultural organizations structure, plan, and measure their digital activity. Very niche. Uh, we did loads of desk research, we did a survey of nearly 60 organisations, we did in-depth interviews with digital leaders, and then we did a follow-up survey of nearly 100 organisations in terms of measuring success. And the headlines of our research made a few things clear to us. Um, to be digital, we have to accept there are a few problems within cultural institutions that we have to deal with. We've got a skills problem, shortage, however you see it, a measurement problem, and a commitment problem. So the skills problems, and skills are cited by Nesta, who's a funding body in the UK, as one of the major blockers of digital ambition in culture. But also, the sector told us that even though things like technical leadership and data management uh, and analysis are considered the most important skills, they're actually not well represented on those digital teams. So we're in stark conflict. Why is this? It's probably because we don't pay enough. But obviously, ask anyone whether they feel that they are adequately paid for their work, and it's likely they'll disagree. Uh, pay is currently a hot topic within the sector, uh, and for some potential applicant, it could be a barrier to joining uh, or remaining with an organisation. And the skills that are most in demand are also the most expensive skills, given that how in demand they are beyond uh, our sector, and people can command significantly higher salaries outside of museums uh, and in the commercial world. But it's not all bad news. For example, the One by One project uh, aims to help UK museums of any size better define, improve, measure, embed, uh, the digital liter literacy of their staff uh, and their volunteers in all roles at all levels. And also, more, imp uh, more importantly probably, the funding bodies are now focusing their efforts and their funding uh, on the less glamorous parts of digital transformation. Okay, the measurement problem. So in our more recent survey, we asked people what they were measuring in terms of digital activity and also what metrics are important. But it actually turns out we're measuring the stuff that we don't truly believe in. So, um, you know, talking about things like visitor numbers to websites. Well, actually, that, becomes, that comes under volumes. Everyone's measuring it, but no one really thinks it's important. So the question, at, question around that is, why are we setting these as targets for ourselves if we don't truly believe? So... According to Chris, it's a lot easier to measure reach and volume than conversions and reputation. Okay, so why is this? It's because of the streetlight effect. Um, a type of observational bias that occurs when people only search for something where it's easier to look. And I've got a feeling that this doesn't just apply to our digital metrics. Okay, and finally, we've got a commitment problem which is mainly due to the fact that we're not investing enough in digital platforms. Um, and when we asked people if their annual budgets were big enough, not surprisingly, they said no. But it's not just the short-term revenue cycles that we need to consider, but it's the long-term investment in digital. As Rob said, breaking budgets out of yearly cycles for things like main platform development seems to be key, seeing digital infrastructure as core capital investment. And our research reveals as well there are nuances between the structure of digital teams within cultural institutions. And we came to understand that digital and cultural organizations is a journey. Um, and those digital, digital teams are part of a shifting culture rather than a permanent structural fixture. By the way, no one has really uh, reached that holistic, apart from the white pube, who obviously are truly digital natives. But in terms of transformation, we're kind of gathering around the kind of one location which is centralised and trying to be more hub and spoke. But I think that's a, an okay decision for now. The structures of digital teams are evolving. They're drawing in more functions as well. 
For example, we've seen in the UK drawing in marketing, visitor experience, publishing, and those kind of functions. But we're still too distracted by the bling. And, as Oliver said, without adequate revenue to invest in ongoing digital development, attention and effort will be constantly pulled in the direction of highly vis visible digital initiatives that might be more opportunistic than they are strategic, those vanity projects. Um, so I'm just going to end by sharing some advice that we gathered from people in the sector, try to collate it. Firstly, be brave. Be prepared to try new things, even if it makes, uh, means that you make mistakes. Um, be prepared to pivot. Change or stop the things that aren't working. Restructure teams uh, if they're not getting the right results. Be you. Understand what is unique about your organization and how digital can support it. Don't blindly follow what others are doing if it doesn't work for you. And as Zach says, Digital teams are still in their infancy in the sector. We're building the future digital teams right now and should share, share, and share some more. So I'm going to stop there, but if you're interested, there's a lot more to read. It's pretty heavy going, some of it. Uh, but feel free to get in touch with us to find out more and help us decide where we're going to take some of this research next. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, David, for this enlightening presentation. And now I'm delighted to present you Ina Good. Uh, originally, by training, she's an art historian. And three years ago, she took the challenge to somehow renovate uh, and redevelop creatively, which is probably the most uh, important uh, Jewish culture festival uh, in Germany, which is. I hope I will pronounce it well. Jüdische Kultur Tage in Ruhr. And uh, she will now present uh, her findings and this challenge of these years. Thank you, Juan. And um, yes, hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. I was very honored. Um, yeah, I'd like to share with you a story of a festival that took, took place last year, almost a year ago that took us two years of preparation. And to tell you how we changed the message of a festival, um, of the largest festival, Jewish event in Germany. Um, the story started when I was asked to take over this festival in 2015. And honestly, I wasn't very fond of this idea. Um, the festival uh, took place, uh, had taken place um, from 2000s, early 2000s, it had its very core structure. It had its own um, audience, and um, it was boring. <laughs> well, in my opinion, it was boring. Basically, um, it showed all the stereotypes that we usually, oh, I have this one thing. Oh. Um, it had all the stereotypes that we usually think of, or most people in Germany think of whenever they hear or talk of Jewish life. Um, and these are mostly three things. Um, this is quite depressing. And these three things have one thing in common. This is not what the Jewish life looks like in Germany today. Um, so finally, in 2017, I agreed to take over this festival on one condition that I would be able to change the message of the festival. I was allowed to. The board of our organization trusted me, and we went to work. So our message was simple. Jews in Germany live to, Jews are living in Germany today. We have a Jewish community of about 200,000 people in the whole of Germany and the biggest Jewish community in North Rhine-Westphalia with 30, over 30,000 people. So these people are raising their children here, they pay taxes here, they um, feel at home, they have their friends here. So for us, the topic of the festival, Zuhause, oops, was the thing that we wanted to be the message of. 
this is our home. And by the way, I can totally relate to the homesick vegetables. Like really, this was the core discussion of the whole festival beforehand. And we wanted um, also to encourage the Jewish community in Germany to not to be dependent on the acceptance of the others. You don't have to be accepted by the others in order to feel home. You are allowed to do it by yourself. So this is, these three images, this is how our mood board looked like. Um, and my strong opinion on this whole thing was in 2019, for the first time since the Shoah, um, Jewish culture in Germany was about the living and not about the dead. It's a strong opinion, but still it was a fun festival, don't worry. And um, just let me give you some, some key facts. We had a festival that took place in 17 days in a row. We had 15 cities involved in the North Rhine, Northern Rhine area and Ruhr area. We had over 160 organizers, which means it was cultural institutions, museums, all these kind of things. We had 200, 220 events, which means we had exhibitions, we had concerts, we had lectures. Um, we had all kind of di different disciplines involved. And in the end, we knew that we had, now we know, we measured it, we had over 15,000 guests in total. Um, in cooperation with city councils of the, of the cities involved and strong support by the state government, uh, but also with sponsors such as Wahl and Ströer, which are um, quite big advertisement um, companies in Germany in public space, um, we managed to set out this strong, positive, unique message of the festival. And to reinvent this whole thing um, took us one week and many, many bottles of wine. But to restructure the whole festival, we needed two years. So what exactly was digital about it? Um, and we thought about it, we wondered also after the invitation, so what exactly was it that felt so digital? And we found out that it was the mindset. We, besides the social media, and of course we had a website, and we tried to interact with the audience by, by Instagram, and um, we had a Spotify playlist, which I am very proud of, but some are not so much, but, but, it's, but it's very cool. Um, um, there were more to it than that, because we implemented the digital within the structure of the preparations. We asked ourselves, how do you deliver the message without explaining it to people all the time? Because this was the problem that we had in advance. We had to inform our partners, we had to inform all cultural institutions, artists, what exactly are we expecting from them? So we had to explain it all the time. And, uh, and we were afraid that we probably would had to have to explain it also to the audience. So how do, you, how do you transport the message? And we figured out that actually what we were working towards was the user experience. We wanted the user or the audience or all people involved to experience what it is and what it takes to make a Jewish event. So in this, in my opinion, is um, the, well, I'm not working in the digital sphere, but I think that probably this could be the basis of all digital projects. How do you bring the people to engage? And our approach was that of classic product design or user experience. We had to research um, similar festivals. Um, we had to prototype a concept that we wanted to achieve we had to test it on, with our partners, we had to adjust, and of course, in the end, we had to deliver. By the research, we found out that almost all major cities in Germany have their own days of Jewish culture. But the structure of these festivals was completely different from that was, that was expected from us in North Westphalia because we wanted many cities to be involved. These are all limited to one city, have different structure, which means it is organized by the municipality itself or by the local Jewish community. We had many partners that we had to bring together. 
So we found out there's no role models that we, that we could use. We had to start from scratch, which was our prototype. And after the test and after, um, after bringing together all of our partners, we had only one adjustment to make. We wanted to be the ones to bring over the message. And we decided we, have, we need a festival center. And we had one space in the middle of Dusseldorf in the old city where we had, had our own um, events. We had also concerts in there, we had parties in there. We, had, we were present there all the time and people were invited to visit us and just to take whatever they need from this festival and from this event. But user experience, and this is quite important, was not only limited to audience for us, it was also um, about the partners who were engaged in the festival, who were engaged in the organization, who were not in the core team of ours. Which means we designed a database. In this database, everyone who was involved could have a calendar overview. They had a status education, a indication of all the events, which means they had to implement all the events within the database. They had also a possibility to, of editing, um, all information for further print publications, if they, if they print products, if they wanted to have a booklet or something like that. So um, we wanted all of them be ambassadors of the message of the festival. We wanted them to be part of it. And by this approach, which means by thinking in new digital standards, we managed to break the narrative. From this to this to that. And let me conclude with one small anecdote that occurred to us in the end of the festival. The last event that we had was a rave. We organized a rave party, like a little Berghain feeling in Dusseldorf, in one of the most innovative cultural spaces in Dusseldorf in the NRV Forum. We invited a DJ from Tel Aviv. We had over 600 people there. And late at night, at one point, we overheard a conversation, or it was more like a yelling at each other because it was quite loud. One party guest yelled to, each, to another one, if the Jews are going to make another rave next year, I'd definitely be there. And this was more than we could wish for. Thank you. Well, thank you enough for this uh, journey of about your narrative, really, which is we were preparing uh, this uh, talk uh, some weeks ago. I remember what you were saying that uh, the original, I wouldn't call it product, but the original festival was somehow boring. So you, you have to somehow create a new narrative and it's something which is also, I think it's similar for all of our projects. Also by seeing the seven museums in, in Wales, which look uh, by uh, checking at the websites, uh, we, we had a look and they really look uh, extremely, how to call it, uh, very attractive. Uh, also, thanks to the branding somehow that we have created, but there's a classic uh, content into it and you have reframed it into another way of somehow presented it. So I think that's, uh, that's uh, well, both cases are very enlightening. Uh, thank you. You were also the discussing, I think, do we have some minutes? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, okay. I think also we were also going to how digital can we be? Uh, we, I think we all agree in that sentence that experience is the technology, not experience is important, it's the narrative, it, also leads to the, also to a new experience. In the case of the apps, it's uh, also uh, interesting for us in smart places uh, what you were explaining because we are also developing have been developing an app which was on the original proposal and has been uh, very I won't say complicated, but it's somehow uh, difficult to adjust not only the contents, the message, the language. Language is also a key uh, key thing because 
uh, when we did this conference last year, we had to translate. It's very difficult to get cultural managers in Spain to stay, to stay in a one-day conference uh, without translation. Or we thought maybe some years ago, if you put the contents in English, it will work. Absolutely not. It doesn't work in, in Spain. I don't know in, what you're experiencing in the Gaelic. It, I think it, that's another issue, but... Hello. Uh, yeah, um, obviously we uh, produce everything in Welsh as well as English, so I do apologize, English is my second language. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I think it's more about... So we don't, we don't translate anymore, or we try not to. I think, as Inna correctly said, you know, it's very much about um, reaching and being relevant through cultural identity and through writing in English, translating into Welsh, it might not actually reach the people that we want it to reach. Um, so we try and produce content for those audiences because there are differences, there are nuances in how people consume that content as well. I see. And also the, the crucial role of mediation is something I mentioned in the beginning, I think something we have learned in our case with smart places especially, but with many of our programs, we thought uh, originally that you have activities for kids, you have activities for students, you have activities for adults. With technology, you will reach all of them, but you need to speak their language and you need mediators to do that digitally, but also physically. You have to spend time with the people. Mm -hmm. What having your experiences uh, with that, in which is relating to mediation for in your case with the festival, especially you were mm -hmm. something you, you we talk about when we were preparing this talk was about elder people over 60, 65. We are not really IT savvy. Most most of them don't have a smartphone, for example. How how do you reach this communities? Um, yeah, we 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 did a research on that as well. We we had um, target groups, which we indicated quite quite narrowly. We, we knew that because we had also this group of um, Jewish community members whom we also wanted to have at the, at the festival and they need a completely different approach. Not only are most of them elderly people, we have an average age of um, almost 60 by now in Jewish communities, so um, we also needed um, many languages. We needed to provide information by phone, mostly in Russian. We had to provide information, not so much in Hebrew, not as much as we wished the Israelis to come, because there are not so many in, in, in Dusseldorf, but they're, um, or as far as I know, but they're not very engaged in the Jewish community so much. But we also were prepared for that. So we had almost, I think, four languages um, at the start. We knew that we need four languages, also for the lecturer of all the information that we had. Um, so, and, and, and this is, um, this was the case. We knew we had the elderly people that need another language and another device. We knew that we had to provide the information by phone because they're calling me, like in the 80s, 90s, they're calling, they want to know, and they want to talk to me. They, they not only have, have like, I have a question, someone just tell me. No, no, I want this one person and I want her to tell me. And mostly they have a question, who are you and why are you doing this festival? Because they're experts as well. So. This is a very interesting and very time-consuming <laughs> task, but I, I think um, it also depends on um, on variety on events. They, each target group has its own preferences. They, they want special events uh, to be in the festival. If not, they're not coming. And they're telling you that it's garbage. Festival is garbage. You, you, what you're doing is wrong. Um, so um, we were prepared to communicate in different different ways, um, different languages, and also on different levels. Mm. Whatever comes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and w with the National Museum of History, uh, we when we were redeveloping uh, the museum, it was about the conversations that we were having with the local communities as well as the communities of interest as well. Um, so we had similar resource implications, but it the end result is much more um, 
much more relevant and uh, respectful as well. So yeah, it does take more time, but it, if you don't do that kind of co-production process, then you don't know until the, you know, the launch date where you're cutting the ribbon whether what you've done is right or not. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I just would like to add that we also had all kind of print uh, products as well because we want we knew that there are people who are not using the device or they don't know how or they just don't want to. So they are um, they 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 are used to having a program in their hand, which means that we had a lot of discussions within the database because I was very strict with the number of characters within the description box because I knew that this one database is used for everything. It's used for the digital product, but it's also used for the for the print product. I was in, chi in charge. So I had a lot of conversations about that, <laughs> but it all worked out. But we had to, this is the special thing about this database. It worked for all kind of, of information for all the target groups. Yeah, yeah. We also have exactly the same experience because people still keep calling to get information about many of our programs, things which are maybe are not uh, on the website, but or are on the website, but they want to have this certainness about it. They want to be sure if if I engage in this uh, program, uh, will I have the, the outcome, especially also with artists who, who want to maybe prepare something or come to a call. I mean, that's the physical sphere is, is definitely very, very important. And as you were saying, it's very time consuming uh, and it's it, you need resources, you need money, but you need people. And people also with tact, uh, which uh, can somehow translate the message uh, properly. And that's yeah. also something which came out in small places in the change management uh, work package. Uh, the importance of the people who is also giving, is your face to the, to the users. The people who are on the door, the informers, the people who do the guided visits. They really have to have every message, every content tailored for the different users. And that's easy to say, but bloody complicated sometimes. <laughs> that's right. We, we did an augmented reality experience for National Museum Cardiff, and it's still there. If anyone visits Cardiff, go and have a go. I won't charge you the £10 uh, if you flash your Smart Places badge. Um, but to deliver that, because onboarding on people's own mo mobiles is very difficult, we had to then find different mechanisms that were easy for the customer or the user, but a bit more challenging for the organization. And to do that, we had to onboard staff. So visitor services, the shop staff who are handing them out and resetting them. So it was a different challenge for the di digital team, but actually m more worthwhile in terms of the customer journey at the end of that. Okay, so any other questions we have? There are no more questions on the Menti because I think everyone's getting a bit too comfortable now. They put away their phones and they're paying attention, which is great. I have one um, little question that I would like to ask when we were talking, David, um, as you were saying, there's very low turnover in, in the museum, which is great, which shows that it's a very nice place to work. People are staying for a very long time. And you also commented on the fact that if the salaries aren't good enough, then we're not going to attract new young talent who have these digital skills. But what we hear time and time again in the media is that millennials don't care for salaries as much as they care for purpose and as much as they care for autonomy in their work. So do you think, considering that people aren't quitting anytime soon, you can take some of that sentiment and somehow bring that into the culture with your existing staff? Or how do you plan to overcome that? <laughs> it's a big a, question. It's a big question. It's a big one, question. One that I haven't got an answer to, but I've got a view. I think there are some roles that actually they're, they're few and far between. If you're a curator and your specialism is within you know, uh, certain aspects of biology, uh, then obviously there's only a handful of roles. So you want to get into that in institution and hopefully develop your research base. Mm. But when it comes to those roles that are more, I guess, uh, common across the public, uh, cultural and private sector, mm. then it's more challenging to get those people in, which means the skills that are in demand across the different sectors are the ones that we really can't afford. But we do have, uh, as I said earlier, people trust us. And we have this kind of ethical uh, badge, I guess, that people really want to feel like they're doing something meaningful. Mm -hmm. And it's a fine balance of um, hooking people in 
and taking advantage as well <laughs> because we don't you know there's sometimes there's no growth within those roles and and sometimes those those staff can get frustrated in the situations they're in okay thank you very much for sharing about that it was a very good answer to a very big question can we thank this last track with a big round of applause thank you so much for a wonderful conversation that's been captured beautifully behind me thank you very very much